nice because it's copyright waffle. Copyright waffle. Copyright waffle. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hi Hello. There. Welcome to uh, the uh, webinar number 62 um, in the uh, series of copyright and online learning webinars that we have been running in conjunction with the Association for Learning Technology. So my name's Chris Morrison. And my name is Jane Secker. And we are the co-chairs of the uh, Association for Learning Technologies Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest, the cool SIG, the coolest of all the special interest Absolutely. groups. Absolutely, yes. We've always yes. Said, haven't we? And we are really excited this morning um, yes. about this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, it's been quite a long time coming, this piece of work that we've been doing, working with Mark Maletti, who's joining us yeah. um, from Create, learning on screen. He's got multiple hats, Bart. Yes. Um, and he's not wearing any hats. He's not wearing any actual hats, but I think he still probably always can't has to wear more than one uh, figurative virtual hat at any one time. But we'll yeah. get into that in a moment, won't we? So this is the running order for today's webinar. Webinar, we have some copyright news as ever. Favorite. Yep. Um, and then, as we've been saying, the main event is the launch of the Code of Fair Practice for the use of audiovisual works in film education. Um, and that says 9th of June 2023. Yes. And uh, we should point out we're wearing our, we as are, Louisa said, she loves our t shirts. We are wearing our copyright literacy, Enlightenment Strikes Back. Yep. Uh, this is quite an old edition, isn't it's it? An it's an old one, edition. It's yeah, a classic. I think, it, um, I think we might have created these t shirts. 2017 even it could be but yeah. because it's a film cinema theme and because we're we star wars were, geeks we thought we'd uh, bring out the old uh, star wars uh, related t-shirts definitely right let us uh talk about what's happened since we last met yeah yeah so this is something we do for anyone that's not a regular user we like to update people on what we've been doing so many people will know that uh if you see me in my normal online location i've kind of it's sort of got guitars and things in the background and all, all that stuff. Loads. This, is, the, where I was a couple of weeks ago, is a bit cooler than that. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So I don't know if anyone can read what it says at the back or where that studio is. Maybe people might want to guess where you went. Yeah, I think people probably. You went on an aeroplane, a big plane somewhere, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, Detroit, Motown, absolutely, Simon. Good uh, spot. And Sam. So that was Motown Studio A. It was. I was over there for a for a library conference um, in, in in Michigan, so stopping off had to go and, and visit Motown. Absolutely incredible experience, a brilliant museum, so well done. Um, and being in that room, which really hasn't changed at all, it was quite an emotional experience. I have to say, it was it was pretty mind blowing. Yeah. But that was me. That was what I've been up to. Yeah. What about you? Uh, so last week I had a few days off and we're headed down to Dorset. And this is a picture of me um, down on Studland Beach, uh, where I did manage to do some paddleboarding. Mm. And uh, I haven't actually got a picture of me stood up on the paddleboard because um, I fell in every time I tried to stand up. Okay. I managed to well on my knees. Okay. Um, and there is a little bit of video, but I'm quite far in the distance. So I thought everyone would just like to see me. That's me with my paddle. Yes. Um, and that's just after I fell in and got absolutely soaked that's... for probably the second or third time. But it was fun. It was loads of fun. I really liked it. I'm hoping to get a paddle board. It's, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this up seriously. Brilliant. Head off somewhere, you know, out to sea. Apparently that is quite dangerous if you do it when there's a wind blowing you yes, the wrong you way. You need to be careful. Yes. Uh, safety at all times. Yes. Um, I've got a life jacket on there. Okay, very good. So. Right. So let us... Um, move on now to just say that for anybody that wants to catch up on previous webinars this is number 62 you can catch all the other 61 on our uh, blog and also on the alt youtube channel yeah um, i hope we've got greg here who might be able to put some links in the chat for us um to some of those um uh, websites yeah absolutely so um that's that and let's move on to the oh I oh we've stopped, stopped it, it. Copyright news, what have we got? We've got a couple of things, haven't we, coming up? Well, very exciting. Mm -hmm. We are still taking bookings for the Ice Pops conference. Um, it's going to be, if you haven't yet heard about it, 
um, on the 19th to the 21st of July. The main event is happening on the 20th of July, but if you book to come on the conference, you get to come to our pre-conference workshop the day before if you want to, which has got a theme about eBooks and e-lending and being run in conjunction with Create. That is completely included in the booking price, the bargain price if you are an Alt Call Sig member of 120 pounds. Um, and um, you also get an, a couple of social events. We've got an yes, exciting social event we do. Um, both evenings. And um, we're going to be also doing some tours on the Friday of the University of Glasgow Library. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to do a bit of a walking tour around Glasgow as well for those who want to. And, yeah, the programme's really shaping up. We have, because we're in the Advanced Research Centre at the University of Glasgow, it's a fantastic multidisciplinary space. We've also, I think we're going to have some demonstrations of some very cool technology. Yep. Um, yep. So, Greg's been arranging lots and, of exciting and we're going things to catch for up us. With, yeah, Greg and, and, and others later on this afternoon to sort of put in the, the, the kind of finishing touches to the programme. But it's it's there, it's available, yep. and we really um, look forward to seeing you there. You yeah, 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 definitely. Another thing related to a conference that we were at, we yeah, mentioned so this, didn't we, last time? We did time. mention this last time because we had just recorded um, the um, Chatting Info Lit podcast that we did at the Lilac Conference um, with uh, the Information Literacy Group's new professionals team. They've mm -hmm. run, they've set up a, a podcast um, and they interviewed uh, Chris and I and also um, Mark Childs, who's one of the um, people behind Pedagogzilla, which is another amazing podcast. Um, which is pedagogy with some pop culture. With um, a pop culture twist, I think it. is what yeah. they say. Yeah, but there's a, it's a really good um, discussion. There's lots of funny uh, little outtakes and things in there as well. There's lots of um, excerpts from people who were at the Lilac conference talking about um, what they're enjoying about the conference. And um, yeah, if you want to find out about how we got started with Copyright Waffle, our podcast, and some tips, have, have a listen. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's a good one. Um, this is a case uh, copyright lawsuit in the US, which uh, I thought would be useful to look at, um, is Andy Warhol versus Lynn Goldsmith. So this is a sort of long awaited um, ruling from the US courts as to whether the Andy Warhol silkscreen version of Lynn Goldsmith's original picture of Prince uh, was an infringement of copyright. Um, and the court found that it was an infringement, um, that the fair use argument didn't stick because effectively the use of Andy Warhol's version uh, of the um, of the of the of the image effectively had the same market in terms of being used as a magazine illustration. So there's lots more. There's there's link there. There's quite a few other links um, in the copyright news newsletter mm -hmm. that Matt Voigt puts out from from IFLA. So Matt was our guest last week. I think many people will have signed up to that. Uh, but that's quite an interesting decision one to look at when looking at um, what can, is considered fair use yeah. um, in, in artworks. Um, another um, thing sort of, I guess, related to, to copyright, I picked this up off uh, Sheila Weber's information literacy blog. Um, there is um, a call for papers out from um, the ARL, the American College and Research Libraries um, group, um, for um, chapters about text and data mining. Um, and um, I just thought it's it's also interesting because they've created another literacy, calling it text and data mining literacy. OK. Um, and um, I thought that might be something people were interested in contributing to. Absolutely. I mean, um, we, we don't have it on our list of things to contribute to. We don't. We've got quite a long oh, list of commitments already. So writing a chapter on text and data mining and copyright implications. I, maybe there are people already in the process of, of doing that, but it would just thought it would be useful to let people within the community know that that's there because yeah. clearly that is an incredibly important part of text and data mining literature. Definitely and also if you don't follow Sheila's blog then it's the best place to find out what's going on in the world of information literacy as well mm -hmm. and she did a great write-up um, on her blog she was at the Lilac conference. Well she was very nice about what we did so yes, it, of course was. it was good. It was a great write-up <laughs> <laughs> about our session yeah. Um, Excellent. Um, uh, so the, the, is this the final piece of news? Yeah, I think, I think it so. Is? Yeah. Uh, so as we've mentioned, we are part of the, our special interest group is part of the Association for Learning Technology. Um, and uh, Billy Smith is the incoming chief executive designate. So we just wanted to uh, say welcome to Billy. We're really looking forward to continue to working with the Association for Learning Technology. We're quite 
yeah, it's emotional to see um, Maren, Maren yeah. Deepwell, who's been uh, heading up Alt for many years, yeah. moving on. Just, it is, it is. But it's great for her to be, you know. Yeah, and I think they're going to be, I think they'll be doing a handover over the next couple mm -hmm. of months. So we look forward to meeting Billy. But yeah, we've been so, so grateful to Maren for all the support she's given us in creating the group and supporting the webinar series. And long may that continue, we hope. So, yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So we are now on to the main event. Um, we are talking here about the Code of Fair Practice for the use of audiovisual works in film education. Um, this is a project that we've been working on along with Bart Maletti at Learning on Screen. So uh, we're going to hand over to Bart now uh, to talk us through the background of the code. Um, and we're going to pick out some of the things that are within it. Um, as we've mentioned, Bart has many hats. He is learning on screen. I think research executive introduced himself, but he's also uh, the, the creative genius behind copyrightuser.org um, and is also working hard on his, his PhD. So uh, has he got a hat on though? That's has he got a hat on? Let's find out. Bart, are you there? Can you hear yes, us? I am. Can you there hear he me? Is. Uh, we can, yes. Yeah. No, thanks very much for the kind introduction. So I think yeah, you already said it all. So yeah, I work for Learning on Screen and that's the capacity in which I've been working on this project, but also for the CREATE Center at the University of Glasgow. And so yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as you said, it's been a very long, but also you know, interesting and rewarding uh, project. Uh, and we are finally launching the Code of Fair Practice for uh, film educators which is basically a project that is intended to encourage the lawful use of audiovisual materials for educational purposes. Uh, so what I'd like to do uh, during this short presentation is to uh, tell you a little bit about the methodology that we adopted. And then I'll show you some highlights of the data we collected through those methods. And I conclude by showing you some parts of the code, hoping that that will prompt a discussion uh, with everyone. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I just wanted to contextualize the project a little bit. So, you know, why do we need a code of fair practice in the first place? Well, as you know, you know, in under copyright law, there are, uh, you know, basically two main ways in which you can lawfully use existing materials. You can either use them with permission from the copyright owners or without permission. So the good thing about you know, using materials with permission is that it's usually safe and reliable. So for example, at Learning on Screen, uh, we offer Bob, uh, which is a streaming service for education that allows staff and students at subscribing institutions to browse and use uh, over 3 million broadcasts under the terms and conditions of the year license. And the good thing about it is that, you know, as long as you stick to the terms and conditions of the license, then you're safe. You know, in, the risk of infringement is potentially zero. However, you know, there are, of course, only a certain number of materials available on Bob and, uh, you know, covered by the year license and a certain number of uses. So what if, you know, in this case, a film educator wants to use a film or another audiovisual work that is not covered by the year license or is not available on Bob? Or what if they want to use it in a way that is not covered by the license? So that's where uh, copyright exceptions uh, become very important, you know, in enabling educational uses in this case that are not permitted by licenses. And so like, you know, exceptions like illustration for destruction or research and private study, for example. So, but while on the one hand, you know, exceptions play a very essential role in the copyright system, on the other hand, they also come with issues. And one of those issues is that they uh, embed ambiguous concepts uh, that, and, and that, you know, that has not been tested in high courts and therefore the scope of application is uncertain. In a way, uh, this project, you know, the, the codes of uh, fair practice, what they try to do is to address this issue by identifying the principles and practices that are considered acceptable and fair by a certain community, in this case, the film education community. And we do that with a view to giving some content to those ambiguous concepts and, you know, ultimately to encourage the lawful use of audiovisual materials. So to enable, in this case, film educators to, you know, use all the materials they need uh, to achieve their pedagogical goals. So how did we do that? How did we, you know, actually identify such practices and principles? So as, uh, you know, Chris and Zay mentioned, we started quite a long time ago, back in 2020. 
uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we carried out two online workshops, uh, which had a twofold goal. First, to identify the main copyright issues faced by film educators uh, in reusing existing materials. And also, they try to enable participants to deliberate on what constitutes fair practice in reusing existing materials. So what, what they think you know, should be acceptable. Uh, the workshops attracted 48 uh, film academics from uh, many different institutions from all uh, the British nations. And uh, the, uh, the, the workshops adopted a three-step design. So basically what we did first, we asked participants to fill, uh, to complete an introduction, an introductory survey, which was designed to help them reflect upon their teaching practice and come up with real life examples of reuse for educational purposes. And as part of step one, then after that, they had to, we broke them into smaller groups and they had to come up with the first statement of uh, fair practice. Um, after the second step was uh, an educational uh, element. So basically Chris, Jane and I gave a little talk about the UK copyright law focusing on educational exceptions. And after that, the third step was that the participants had the opportunity to revise statements based on the you know the, the guidance they just received so the workshop generated lots of interesting data and uh, we were able to identify three main areas of the discussion so people were particularly interested in how to source content uh, lawfully how to use content lawfully and you know about responsibility meaning uh, you know who would be responsible you know if things go wrong and um, more uh, specifically, we were also able to code the various statements and notes uh, into four main categories. Uh, so first, uh, the need, so what they need, you know, from a pedagogical point of view, uh, the challenge that they encounter, you know, in responding to those needs, uh, the practice, so what they do in practice to overcome those challenges, and finally, the principle, so what they think, you know, should be, you know, sort of an ideal, uh, situation and so while the, you know the workshops were very successful uh, uh, in achieving the first goal so in, in generating a picture of the main copyright issues faced by the film educators uh, however they were not as successful at enabling participants uh, to deliberate on uh, fair practice probably there wasn't just enough time uh, to do that to agree what you know fair practice should look like so to do that, what we did then was to design a follow-up deliberation questionnaire, again, based on the data collected through the workshop. And then we sent that questionnaire to both the people who participated in the workshops, but also we uh, circulated a separate link to the same questionnaire via the same channels through which we had advertised the workshops, um, basically to get also an, well, to get you know, more views, but also to see whether there were any differences in perception between those who participated and, you know, got that educational element I mentioned and those who didn't. And the questionnaire, um, you know, was, uh, I mean, most questions were uh, scenario based, uh, some were with a multiple choice, other with a Likert scale type of question, which is, you know, what you usually do uh, in the liberation exercises. But I would say that you know, probably the most interesting data were generated through open questions, like uh, this one I wanted to uh, show you. Uh, so, again, you know, at the, at the workshops, the, uh, some of the participants uh, teaching script writing mentioned that they, you know, needed to screen the entire film to their students to show how, uh, you know, a script is developed from beginning to end. And so we took that as a hook to ask everyone, well, can you think of other examples of, you know, when you need to show an entire film to achieve your learning outcomes? And that generated lots of very uh, interesting statements that we then used to draft the code and that we were able to categorize under these, uh, you know, four main categories, uh, general remarks, uh, learning outcomes, uh, subject specific considerations and uh, clips versus whole films. So before showing you the actual code, I just thought I'll give you some highlights to you know, give you a more concrete idea of what I'm talking about. So general remarks you know, were things like, you know, I believe that when you teach any single creative aspect of film, then you need to show uh, complete films. Um, whereas the, what we categorized as learning outcomes were more specific and very interesting. We were actually able to subcategorize them into you know, subcategories. 
So there was quite a, a focus on you know, the need to expose students to a wider range of films, so a to a more diverse range of films that, than what they would normally watch. Uh, there were a few statements about the need to enable students' activities and examination. So for example, to encourage discussion and debate immediately after screening a film, as well as encouraging critical analysis. Critical analysis then became um, a category, a category on its own, because uh, uh, yeah, quite a lot of the statements refer to critical analysis, and we, we were able actually to code them into subcategories again. So there were some general statements about critical analysis, like the first one you see here, you know, to appreciate the entire work of art in order to analyze it critically. But then there were quite a lot of uh, more specific statements about the importance of watching a whole film uh, to analyze narrative, narrative structure, and so on. And then also, there were a few um, comments and statements about production disciplines. So you need to show you know, the whole film in order to uh, show consistency, for example, in sound design, visual effects, and or uh, color grading across the duration of a film. And also, there were a few uh, comments about authorship. So if a class is studying an author, uh, then they will need to see the whole film uh, from the over. Yeah, sorry, my friends, but yeah, you get, I hope what they meant there. And interestingly, there were also a few, uh, uh, you know, subject specific considerations. So apparently, you know, showing the whole film is very important uh, uh, for, you know, uh, educators who teach film history. Uh, there were quite a lot of comments about, you know, teaching film history. For example, you know, st students need to understand the work as a whole, to understand how it fits within its historical context. And also there were a few about uh, musicology and film musicology tracing the development of musical themes and motives across the whole film and so on. And finally, the, yeah, like a couple of more um, uh, you know, comments about other um, you know, subjects, you know, world cinema, world cultures, literature and culture, and so on and so forth. And finally, the, what we categorized as clips against versus entire films were basically yeah, comments uh, that uh, spoke to the, you know, the need and opportunity to show an entire film in general you know, versus just showing clips, uh, you know, like this one, you know, you can't appreciate a performance arc without uh, watching an entire film. You cannot experience the full work as it's supposed to be experienced. You cannot judge the elements of genre, structure, or have a, an understanding of the cinematic language or psychology of cut. And, you know, these are, I think, uh, incredibly interesting data, you know, because they, you know, under fair dealing, uh, you know, potentially one can use the whole uh, work as long as they can justify it in relation to the purpose of the use. And, you know, that's what I meant before when I said, you know, these exercises uh, sort of give content to these ambiguous concepts. You know, you, here really you can see real life examples of, you know, why the film education community in particular, you know, in many cases does need to show uh, the whole film, you know, and that, you know, may help, I think, in a fairness analysis in favor of the educator. So the next step then after you know collecting and systematizing all these different data was to actually draft the code and uh, sorry something i should have probably mentioned earlier is that uh, this whole initiative is inspired by a very similar initiative uh, in the us uh, which developed at the american university um, uh, a series of code of best practices in fair use uh, which was led by patricia hafterheide and peter yazzi and they started back in 2004 i think and so, yeah, that was our main source of inspiration. And it was also our main source of inspiration for uh, the structure of the code. So we decided that, you know, they were successful. So we tried and tested the same structure they adopted. So uh, we basically structured the, the code, as I showed you in a second, around four main uh, types of use. Uh, and uh, for each use, we described the use using the language we collected through the workshops and the follow-on questionnaire. Then we try to summarize what uh, is considered you know, fair by the film educators and sort of lawful uh, by lawyers in a short principle. And uh, so, you know, more like the fairness aspect in the principle. And then the legal aspects are the considerations that follow the principles. Uh, so a list of considerations uh, that I, again I'll show examples shortly, and the finally uh, followed by a hard case, so a sort of a borderline case uh, that you know tries to uh, you know show where you know the the 
yeah, the border between lawful and unlawful becomes a bit more unclear. So after uh, drafting, you know, uh, producing a first draft of the code, then it went through a re uh, review process. Uh, first, we got the draft peer reviewed by the workshop's uh, participants. Uh, we got uh, several comments and we implemented them. And then the, the rewrite was then submitted to the Learning on Screens uh, Copyright Advisory Panel, uh, which is a group of experts, of copyright experts from uh, government, academia, and industry who advise uh, Learning on Screen on our uh, copyright literacy strategy. And uh, so we got also a lot of very useful comments uh, from the Copyright Advisory Panel. We implemented them. And finally, just a few days ago, we published the final version of the code. Uh, so yeah, you'll, uh, you can find the link uh, to the web version of the code uh, here in the chat. Uh, but yeah, that's how it looks like. So the four uh, main types of uses that we identified were first, allowing students equitable access to a diverse range of films. Second, allowing students to critically analyze films. Third, adapting films for teaching and learning purposes. So things like creating video essays, for example. And finally, the fourth type of use is a sort of use that crosses over the other three, which is, you know, to format shift film content, uh, you know, which is often needed in order to be able to, you know, use the films in all the other ways. So to conclude uh, uh, the presentation, I thought I'll just show you uh, one of these uh, four uh, uses. Um, and I picked the second one, allowing students to critically analyze films. Uh, because I thought, you know, as you can see from this description, uh, you know, it's uh, pretty clear how, you know, this reflects the language that we collected, you know, through in particular that open question I showed you earlier. So basically, you know, participants explain to us, you know, how and when, you know, they need uh, to show films for, you know, to enable critical analysis and so on and so forth. So this first, we have a description of, you know, what the film communities, you know, uh, needs. Uh, from a pedagogical point of view. And then we try to summarize the, you know, a principle of fairness here uh, by saying that it is fair to screen and watch films, whether in parts or in their entirety, when aimed at enabling and encouraging critical analysis, subject to the following. And the following are the list of considerations I mentioned earlier, uh, which uh, basically, in a way, you know, they try to describe the you know, the thought process that one needs to follow from a copyright point of view in order to make informed decisions, you know, on these issues. So, you know, the description of the use is, you know, what a lot of film educators describes, what a lot of film educators need uh, from an educational point of view. And then this is like the legal part is a sort of, uh, you know, a check uh, list or, you know, like a list of considerations that one needs to bear in mind. So the first two uh, speak to the two main exceptions we thought are relevant for this uh, specific type of use. So the first one speaks primarily to illustration for instruction and other educational exceptions. So we say that you know, when the film is analyzed for non-commercial educational purposes, then more extensive uses are generally permitted by law. And uh, generally speaking, you know, educators can use film clips or entire films as required by their pedagogical aims. Then the second consideration uh, speaks to another, uh, uh, you know, copyright exceptions that is not specific to the education sector, but is still very relevant, which is criticism or review. So how we phrased it here is that critical, critical analysis of films may be allowed even for commercial purposes and beyond educational settings if the primary purpose for using the film is criticism or review of the film itself or of another work rather than education. So these two considerations sort of set the scene. And I mean, as you can see at that uh, link, you know, uh, most of this the, this consideration come with a footnote where you can find the actual legal uh, reference. Uh, and the third one then goes into the fairness analysis, you know, that is required, you know, because of course, you know, there are all these different exceptions for different purposes. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning, you also, you know, one of the main uh, things to consider is that your use needs to be considered fair. Um, so here we say that, you know, educators, educators and students should only use as much of the film as is necessary to achieve their pedagogic and scholarly aims. Uh, using a film for commercial purposes under fair dealing usually requires a larger amount of direct criticism or commentary rather than using it for non-commercial educational purposes. 
and that educators they should be prepared to explain the intended significance of the film used in relation to the purpose of the use. So in this uh, consideration, basically, what we tried to do was to summarize what we know from case law, uh, particularly around uh, uh, the exception for criticism uh, of review. We try to you know, explain it in an accessible language. Uh, again, you know, basically the, you know, the, the criteria and the, the fairness factor that you should only use, you know, the, the excessive use in relation to the purpose that you should only use what you need to achieve your purpose. And then the, the last two considerations, one is quite slightly doctrinal. So what does commercial purpose means, which is, was another, uh, you know, uh, another issue that came up a lot during the workshops. Uh, and so here we clarify that commercial purpose relates to the use itself, not the status of the organization. So in principle, even a for-profit organization can rely on uh, exceptions like illustration for instruction that only uh, permit uh, non-commercial uses. And finally, uh, we again refer to uh, the statute. You know, we say, unless this is impossible for practical reasons, then the authors of the film should be acknowledged. And we also clarify that uh, under UK copyright law specifically, uh, the authors of the film are considered to be the producer and the principal director. And finally, as I mentioned, you know, we conclude with a hard case, a sort of a borderline case. And so in this, uh, in relation to this particular use, we thought it was, you know, useful to know that uh, a fairness assessment changes depending on the type of uh, economic right that is involved uh, and of the circumstances of the use more generally. So here, you know, we say that while, you know, showing a film in its entirety in, a, in the classroom or, you know, in a virtual learning environment that is restricted to only, you know, a certain number of students, you know, is likely to be fair if they use as a clear pedagogical value. Then, you know, if you do the same thing uh, online in a MOOC, in a massive online open course, and you're showing the entire film, then that's, you know, unlikely to be considered fair because then, you know, if you're making the whole film available internet then that may be commercially competing with the copyright or copyright owners work uh, you know which again is one of the fairness uh, factor that one should consider um, so yeah that was just one example uh, I believe the next slide is for uh, Chris to address yeah absolutely thank you Bart um, uh, have I unmuted su successfully can you can you hear me yes Excellent. Right. OK, well, we'll pick it up there. So th thanks so much, Bart, for taking us up to that. So there are four different uses. We've picked out two of them. Um, so the next one we wanted to talk about was this uh, the, the fourth one, format shifting, because we know this is a, um, a topic of conversation that's come up a lot of times. I'm also going to be just putting in the chat here a link to Professor Emily Hudson's legal analysis, uh, which which goes into this question and looks at the different parts of the legislation and how to address that at the time uh, of, of the lockdown. Um, but what we've got here is this description. I picked out this particular part that says education establishments may have to choose between format shifting content from physical media to digital file, files so that students can access films and other audiovisual works that are required for their study or not making works available at all. So within that description, we've really clearly pointed out that there are specific situations where the only option that an educational establishment or educators have is whether to do a format shifting or simply not make that work available because of the nature of um, you know, the access, how accessible it is to get uh, licensed access to it in the first place. Mm. So the principle that we have here is very much uh, built upon Emily's work, saying that it is fair to, to, for teachers and institutions to format shift audiovisual content if this is necessary to provide access to the content for their teaching. Um, but of course, what we've got on top of that is um, the uh, checking with the community and the participants to ensure that their sense of, 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 of what was fair um, also chimed in with that. So, so the considerations we've got here, eight of them. Uh, first is that the film, the audiovisual work should have been lawfully acquired by the institution. Um, the acknowledgement needs to be there uh, in, in this, that second consideration. Again, that links to the requirements in the legislation. Third, um, that where films are under license, reasonable license conditions, um, educators should make those use of those in the first instance. And as uh, Bart has mentioned, you know, we have the ERA license, Box of Broadcasts, uh, Planet Eastream or other services mm. are available. And there are other, other services as well where you can get uh, licensed access to them that are aimed 
uh, the educational market. Um, lawful acquisition does mean ownership of specific titles. Um, we're suggesting lawful access doesn't relate to having a subscription access on an all you can eat business model. Most of those are on sort of com uh, consumer uh, terms anyway, yeah. um, not regarded as lawful acquisition by the institution. Um, educators should be considered expansively. So it isn't just the film lecture itself. It's anybody uh, such as a technician, learning technologist or librarian who is involved in sourcing uh, and making that content available. Um, the sixth point here is uh, in, a, in a, a comparison, whether you know, an online source that is likely to be infringing versus actually an, an education institution uh, format shifting themselves that uh, the, the educator should do that format shifting rather than relying on or uh, the things that may be infringing and out there on, on the broader internet. And that was clearly, that was one of the ones that was based on participant feedback as well as the, the legal analysis. Um, point seven is around circumventing copy protection measures. Um, and we're here being, uh, making people aware that this it could be a, a breach of uh, the uh, legislation. It's not, uh, it's separate from the copyright regime, but there are the provisions there within the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. So they need to be aware of that. Um, and then the final one here is that um, accessing those copies if they are format shifted should only be made available to relevant students um, and uh, it should not be downloaded uh, mm. or downloadable. Um, so any sort of increase in that clearly uh, or, or allowing a, to greater access than that will uh, increase the risk. So um, in the hard cases, we do pick up a bit more on the question of what is institutional policy and about the circumvention of the copy protection. Um, so the first thing to point out, participants did feel that if the format shifting was possible without technical support, that it would be fair to do it if it was necessary to achieve their pedagogic aims. And the, the final part here about um, the, the risk of potential breach of law, it's about balancing that against the pedagogic need and taking a really mission focused approach to that issue, which is, um, as we know, as many of us know, is a, is a very complex one as to what actually does infringe, uh, can constitute circumvention of technical protection measures. But when it comes to institutional policies, uh, the final sentence here I've picked out, which is um, whilst educators need to check those policies, copyright exceptions do remain a powerful tool for enabling access to audiovisual content where licenses are unavailable. Um, so uh, we have got here um, some next steps that we're going to be doing. So Bart, um, we are going to be, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to make the Ice Pops. Uh, oh, hang on. yes. So, the Ice Pops conference in September 2022 last year. We yeah. did do a brief update on it, but we're actually going to be talking about it in uh, July 2023, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, no, no, actually I included those because those were the next steps I showed at the previous Ice Pops uh, conference, ah, just to show yes. that, you know, we actually uh, did three of the main things we said we would do. So, we, uh, you know, we did get... We've done our homework. That's what yeah, that was exactly. About. We did get, uh, you know, as I said, the draft peer reviewed by the workshop participants. We get, got it vetted by the Copyright Advisory Panel. We published it, uh, you know, this week. And I think the next step is basically endorsement and adoption and dissemination. And I thought, you know, I would just encourage, you know, this audience to, you know, please help us do that. You know, if you can, you know, link to the code, you know, from your lib guides or, you know, from your blog, personal blogs, wherever, you know, the wherever, you know, the dissemination is, of course, a very important uh, part of it. So, uh, Bart, I can see we've had quite a few questions come up um, uh, yeah. in the chat um, while yeah. we've been talking. So I don't know if this is a good time now to just have a look at some of those questions. Yeah, yeah, um, and I don't know if anybody who asked a question might want to um, just kind of give us a bit more detail. So our first question, I think, came from Kirsty, which was a query about showing the film I, Daniel Blake, to nursing students, um, where they felt that the whole film would give students a better understanding um, of the topic. It is, it's a film I know um, uh, has been shown, I think, at my university as well um, to nursing students. Um, Kirsty, I don't know if you've got more that you can tell us about that, what, what your particular concern might be there. 
Um, or Bart, if you, you know, do you want to respond to that question? I mean, showing the whole um, film in that instance seems yes. to me fairly clear. Sorry, it's Kirsty. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, hi, we can Kirsty. hear you. Hi, you, Kirsty. Sorry, it's, it's just, sorry, um, chat's not very good and my brain disconnects when I'm typing. Um, I said yes, because when I said to them, what do you want? what do you want it for? And they just said, well, it, it's to give them, a, I can't remember the detail because I don't think they gave me the full detail, but they said mm. it was, it, the whole film was to give the students a sort of context or a background. Um, I think it was on the social issues that might impact um, people who then interact with, um, I think it was mainly nursing students, but I can't remember the module. Um, so think, it's I, that indirect application Absolutely. Um, I think I think that's very useful, Kirsty, for the clarification. And I think I think the, the issue here is quite clear that we have created a code that is focused on film education and yeah. film educators. So it really frames it. And we, we spoke to that community for whom working with film is absolutely integral and essential to what they mm. do. And the question inevitably comes up, as, as as often does, how does this relate to any other teacher working in any other discipline and yeah. do the same principles apply? So, Bart, do you want to um, talk us through? Kind of the background as to why we chose this field and how these principles may or may not apply elsewhere. And Philippa, I see, has asked a very similar question about showing um, a film um, to medical students. Yes. So, Bart. Yeah. No, I think that's a, a very, very important point uh, from you know many points of view. Like the yeah, I mean, in terms of, I mean, that makes me wonder whether we should somehow integrate or you know clarify that. You know, most of these principles also apply to you know any disciplines, really. But uh, yeah, I mean, the way why the, the reason why we chose to start with one particular community is also again, we follow the approach of uh, you know the the American University, basically around the fair use codes. You really need to get a granular idea of you know how different the different needs of different uh, communities. Uh, but this kind of uh, you know, data, uh, so to speak, are uh, really interesting. And, you know, in principle, I think you Kirsty, gave the right advice there. I mean, it also speaks to two of the points we try to make clear throughout our code. The first is that, um, you know, yes, if you can, I mean, if the educator can explain the educational value of showing the whole film, then in principle, that's fair and therefore lawful. Then, you need to look at the considerations, you know, to make sure that, you know, the specific use you're going to make is actually lawful, you know, provide sufficient acknowledgement unless it's impossible uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, I mean, in principle, I would say that the vast majority of the principles and legal considerations we included in our code would apply to using film for any educational purposes. Uh, we just frame those through the eyes of film educators uh, specifically, because that was, uh, you know, one of the communities, especially during the lockdowns uh, at the beginning, who were struggling a lot. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, yes, and, and yeah. absolutely. I, th I also think to, to add to that, the question, is it OK to show a film to students? As we know from any copyright question, the devil is in the detail. Exactly how are you doing? And I'm not suggesting that we drill into that now, but clearly there is. Yeah, if it's showing in a in an actual physical location, mm. then that's clearly covered and has been for many years under Section 34. Mm. Uh, it depends on where it's being sourced from. Um, it depends on how sort of you're managing that. Um, and what we say in the code about going to licensed sources first of all, yeah. you know, and, and looking at those because they present effectively zero risk and our services that are operated by by organisations there to make it easy for us rather than us going through. Um, you know, additional steps. Um, Should we pick up? There's another question about from Susan about um, considering the credits of a film to be sufficient mm -hmm. acknowledgement. So presumably, um, Susan means if you if the credits are just kind of being shown on the screen. Susan, yeah. do you want to come in? Yeah, Hi. this is quite a practical question, really. We have a closed video collection that was done the ERA license, um, yeah. which is now pretty old, shall we say, <laughs> mouldering down in our basement level. And we're looking <laughs> at a format shift that off there um, yeah. and things. So I previously under the ERA license, you had to do quite strict. This is the name of the film. This is, you know, Article, things like that that had to be added to the box the physical sense now we're shifting it over to a digital format and putting that in a closed space behind the login so it is yeah. safely stored and things like that 
do you need would you say that the credits of the film now i know that emily's discussed this previously the credits of the film that roll that tell you who the director produced everything everyone involved in the film is part of that is that enough or do you feel there has to be an attached file that goes with the content to state the things that used to be physically stuck on a video do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i think there's there's a couple of things here there's there's the acknowledgement as per the copyright exceptions and then there's also the requirements of the era license i think they're, they're, they're two different things and i think we wouldn't want to comment on what era <laughs> would regard as uh, acceptable under the license but i think what what is quite clear is when you're relying on copyright exceptions there is a need to be absolutely clear and indicate the basis on which the material is being made available in order to encourage the response or, or you know require the, the responsible use by students and by other staff and i would have thought some sort of citation that appears on the screen before the film is shown um is you know important mm. and you know if it's okay. a digital file um, something in the metadata as well. Um, but I, I think that what we've been looking at, and, and again, these are the conversations that I've had, not, not as part of this project, but as part of what, what we've done within institutions that mm. you know, we've been talking about, is, is that there is a need to make a specific notification of the way that this material has been made available, and that seems to be the appropriate place. Bart, do you want to uh, share your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a, not an issue I've been thinking about in depth, uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's definitely an interesting and important one. I mean, from a law point of view, I mean, I would say if the work includes credits at the end, I mean, that probably would uh, tick the sufficient acknowledgement uh, box. And uh, but uh, yeah, the only other consideration uh, I feel like I, I can make is the, you know, that yeah, you only need to credit the authors of the work. Uh, not mm -hmm. the copyright owner. So again, you know, as we explained in the code, as soon as you credit the producer and the principal director, then under the exceptions, yes, the you know that requirement should be met. Uh, yeah, but yeah, under the year license, probably is a different matter. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't know. You probably know more about this. I mean, that's just my <laughs> intuitive reaction. There is there is a guide, isn't there? I think on the Learning on Screen website about citation. Audiovisual yes. citation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. is one. Yeah, yeah. We can grab the link yeah. to that. Yeah, but and I think... I think that would be that would be worth just sort of flagging up at this mm, point. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much for the question. Um, a, a very good point. Yeah. Um, so the the next one from Grant is picking up on the term reasonable license conditions, which is obviously open to quite a bit of interpretation uh but appreciate that we are keeping this vague uh, again what we would we were doing in addressing this is to say if you say if there are licenses available are they potential licenses or are they actually licenses which are uh, focused on the educational market um so again reasonable is a word that is open to interpretation but we didn't want to either close it down any more than it needed to be uh nor open it up any further or, or try to sort of create a clear line because there are I mean there are there are things out there where you could potentially I guess get a license to do some of this but they're not necessarily aimed at the educational market don't align with what is uh, allowed under uh, UK law so would ne not necessarily um, recognize that we have exceptions that allow us to do certain things but did you want to uh, give your thoughts on that uh, no I think you know you address it very well so yeah we can go to the next one okay Excellent. Um, Philip uh, has asked whether we're going to be um, blogging and writing about the guidelines. We were just um, obviously we're going to be doing quite a lot of promotion about the guidelines. Um, there is a press release um, that's um, been circulated mm. and um, I think we we are looking for opportunities to write about it. I think Chris and I were just saying we, we should probably have a chat with you, Bart, about whether we're going to write an article about it as well. Um, so I think uh, we definitely do want to continue to communicate. Yeah. I think one of the challenges we have is given the amount of work that we did to balance the statements that we made, it, it, we, we need to ensure that we're sort of not um, then adding extra bits to the code that aren't necessarily based on the evidence or the analysis that, that are sort of um, so we, we need to think those through properly, but we certainly do want to be giving examples of finding use cases where people have actually used them uh, and, and have been able to, because we, we hope that this makes things um, 
you know unlocks the potential of audio visual content yeah we've got a really useful um comment from um chris erickson at the university of glasgow about oh. a new research study on the legal status of uh, drm and technical protection measures and how they relate to the enjoyment of in i love the fact you enjoy exceptions yes indeed we always enjoy exceptions yeah i think those results sound fascinating um chris so look forward to to hearing more about that study um and hopefully chatting to you in glasgow in a, a few months absolutely um i notice alex fenland's question um so uh, alex has picked up on um the uh, comments that Grant has made about personal streaming services. So yes, in mentioned in the hard case in A um, around uh, using personal streaming uh, subscriptions uh, and how does that relate to the lawful acquisition point that I was making there around format shifting. Mm. Um, so the, the difference there is uh, in A, we're talking about showing, playing, performing to students you know and, and putting that in an online context as well whereas the other one is about format shifting taking something from that service and then moving it into a file that is then hosted within you know within an institution's own system so that's that's the distinction um between those two so i i i, I hope that makes sense um i don't know whether there was something additional to that alex if you want yeah to i don't know alex the, if you want to Say anything clarify further. if that has answered your question sort of yes sort of no um thank okay. you um <laughs> I, I think um i think the the issue here that follows up from that is about synchronous and asynchronous delivery then i suppose mm. right and so when it's when it's synchronous um streaming it live is covered under a but in an asynchronous mm. model it applies to d right yeah. so where you mm. rip it and, and stick it on a vle then then d applies and a doesn't um lots of the practice that we know that takes place at our institution is more d than a i think um mm. in a hybrid mm. and, and blended learning environment which we still live with it um mm. so I, I found that an interesting distinction within the code itself um and uh yeah just making it clear um, that there are differences in the live performance um, rather mm. than the, the the ripped performance, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. So I, the in in the A section, what we're, we're, the question we primarily get is: Is it okay to show my students a film in the classroom? I don't have the DVD, but I do have my subscription. Can I show them something from? Uh, whatever streaming service they're using and really that's what that one was intended to cover then the question you 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 know the point you make about a asynchronous delivery is absolutely valid and that's why we kind of we make the, the point of principle in in that first uh use a but then when it came to actually doing the format shifting that's a kind of separate area of activity that we put into that area and, and did mm. make that distinction between owning a things on a title basis versus kind of all you can eat access yeah thank you i mean we normally have um copies of the dvds in the library collection right um yeah. going back a few years when people used to have dvds and and dvd players around um so it's it's the the institution would have that lawful copy and we would have that anyway um mm. i'm concerned about institutions versus licenses and permissions lawful access versus personal private subscriptions where the university mm. doesn't have that lawful access to that content so that's what's really triggering my concern i suppose but but i've spoken too much already no, I, the, well i'm just just picking up what e evelyn's asking as well there's, there's a question that's sort of related mm -hmm. um about if you buy the dvd so you have legitimately acquired it but you end up for the purposes um, of, you know, showing the film, doing it via a personal subscription rather than format shifting. I, I think there's, you know, it's it, it it probably comes down to risk, doesn't it? And institutional yeah, policy sort of decisions here. The, the, it, there's, I think there's no getting away from the fact that when we're talking about copyright and we're talking about weighing up exceptions versus licenses, um, each it has to be done on a case by case basis mm. each institution has to develop its own policy um so we feel that what 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 this code does is it sets out the kind of center ground 
Mm. It identifies where the edge cases are. And then there is a certain amount of um, individual flexibility. There's flexibility within there. Yeah. And I think what we what we want to avoid is creating uh, clear, bright lines that effectively act as a ceiling rather than a floor. That's yeah. that's the classic um, challenge there. But I think we're we're going to draw things to a close. But have you got any thoughts on any of that discussion, any of those questions, or any of the, the sort yeah. of principles? No, again, yeah, yeah, we only have three minutes left. So no, I think yeah, I just wanted to make a very similar point that you know this discussion speaks to both one of the main challenges of this kind of exercises and initiatives, but also to an opportunity. I think so. The challenge, as you said. You know, you don't want to, you know, present it as a, you know, as a ceiling of, uh, you know, permitted activities rather as a, as a floor, but also there is the future proof challenge, you know, we don't want to go into a long full lot of detail, because what are, you know, the current technical challenges dealing with DVDs and, you know, personal streaming mm -hmm. subscription may well not be, you know, the, the challenges that the film educators will face in 5, 10 or 15 years. But then the opportunity related to that, I think, is which also sort of uh, speaks to the comment made by uh, Philippe about, you know, like disseminating it through blogs. And uh, I just wanted to highlight, uh, uh, you know, I think the importance of events like this one, and we should do more of these, you know, with different communities and different mm -hmm. people. Because, uh, and also I wanted to take the opportunity to share uh, another uh, create project, which is very similar, where we. Uh, produced other codes of best practices for documentary filmmakers and immersive uh, curators. So basically what I think uh, uh, one of the main findings of going through these all these different uh, projects is that, you know, apart from the, you know, the value of the code itself, there's a lot of value in the process of co-developing these codes mm -hmm. with the communities. You know, like uh, the, there is value in, uh, you know, like collecting the data, as those I showed earlier, but I think there's a lot, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the ultimate goal is to encourage uh, positive change in behavior. So people, you know, become more aware of the law and take advantage of, you know, the opportunities offered by the law. And what I, I've seen is that a lot of that happens by co-developing the code with the community, you know, not just by, you know, it's not just the final product and, and disseminating the final product that has that effect, but just, you know, doing the workshops and, you know, talking with people about these issues you know, raises awareness and does encourage uh, positive uh, changes in behavior. So, yeah, so I just wanted to end on that comment. With thanks. We'll, yeah, we'll leave it there. That's fantastic, Bart. Um, we are almost at 12 o'clock, so we're just conscious of, of keeping everybody to time if they've got to get somewhere else. But thank you for joining us. Um, we will be at the Ice Pops conference also getting feedback and talking to you. We'll and be if running any, if anyone... a session about this code there. Um, if you want to drop us a line, if you've got any thoughts, absolutely, or carry on the discussion on the list copy seek um, discussion list. We'd be very happy to um, to to take this forward. Yeah. So it is uh, just remains for us to tell you what we've got coming up. Um, because of the Ice Pops Pro conference in July, we're not planning to run um, a webinar. Um, in July because we're going to be really busy getting everything ready for the conference and we'll also be taking a break in August um, but we are looking to restart the webinars in September um, currently we are looking to schedule um, some topics for the September and October yeah. event um, November is already um, lined up we're going to have a discussion about open textbooks um, with David Bills at Brunel University and some colleagues who are working on a, a exciting open textbook project um and um yeah if you've got ideas for future webinars then please drop us a line brilliant thank you so much everyone and thanks again to bart for yeah joining us it's been it's, it's been a great really really great work, but yeah. yeah this is just the beginning this is mm. the, the the first launch event for this code and we will be doing lots more about it um uh, we've got one last thing one last thing i know people need to head off that's fine uh we're just pointing out that um Mark Lewison, who we did a podcast with on copyright and the Beatles, he is the leading world leading Beatles historian. Um, it's, he's going on tour. He's going well. He's not really on tour. He's going to London. And he's, he's going, going to, to Salford. Salford. He's going to London and Salford. Um, but if you wanted to find, uh, do uh, immerse yourself in as much deep Beatles as we are now, um, here is his uh, Beatles Evolver 63. So we're going to the one with Johnny Marr. 
He's talking to Samira Ahmed, Harry Hill, Kevin, yeah. uh, Kevin so, Elton. So it's next catch up with us and talk about codes yeah. of fair practice with us. Oh, he loves talking about copyright, doesn't he? Um, Mark loves talking about copyright, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And Bart and I love talking about um, what what series we're watching on Netflix at the moment, don't we? Just to annoy you or, mm. or, or other streaming services that are available. So, Bart, for yeah. people who are still here, what are you watching at the moment? You're binge watching or you just finished watching the yeah, no, latest think, yeah. recommendation from I'd... me. Yeah, I just finished watching Blue Light, which was another great recommendation uh, from you, Jane. Thanks very much. Although I have to say that uh, you also recommended Happy Valley, which was on the BBC I player, which I thought is probably one of we, the We went down a kind of dark, gritty, police uh, yeah. drama sort of uh, strand, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, thank you very much for coming, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>